Good morning, church. Good morning, beautiful people of the Lord. And um, we truly stand in awe in front of God. So this will be our uh, final part of our My Lord and My God series. Last week, we talked about my Lord and my God, our uh, testimony. Okay. So this morning, <clears throat> our final part our series, my Lord and my God, who do you say I am? Let me start first with a quote. How you view Jesus will make all the difference in your life. And um, contemplate on that, and we will get back to that in a bit later. In our scripture reading in Matthew chapter 16, let us read from verse 13 to verse 20. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea in Philippi, he questioned his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, <clears throat> and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you? Jesus asked, Who do you say I am? Now Simon, Simon Peter answered, You are the Christ the son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, whatever you bind on earth, will be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he admonished the disciples not to tell anyone that he was <clears throat> the Christ. First question, what does the world think about Jesus? What does the world think about Jesus? There was a diversity of beliefs and diversity of views among many people regarding the identity regarding the character and purpose of Jesus Christ. Now, with all the verses that we've read, Sam says that he is John the Baptist. And this was probably made famous by the remark of King Herod when he heard of the name Jesus becoming well known at that time. When he said in Matthew chapter 14, verse 2, and said to his servants, This is John the Baptist. He was risen from the dead. That is why miraculous powers are at work in him. Many scholars believe that the only time King Herod heard about Jesus Christ when John the Baptist was beheaded. And so he commented that Jesus was John the the Baptist, that he has risen from the dead. That is why miraculous powers are at work in him. Although John and Jesus, they almost came at the same time, Herod never heard of Jesus. And again, the only time Herod heard about, heard about Jesus when John the Baptist uh, was killed. And uh, some other people in the, in the similar fashion that other people, uh, they just knew Jesus as being also John the Baptist because of the same passion that John came with power and authority and trying to uh, proclaim or preach about repentance. So they thought that Jesus was John the Baptist because Jesus came with power Jesus came with authority, and Jesus came with the same message that John brought to them about repentance. 
So that's why they said that uh, Jesus is John the Baptist. And some say that Jesus was Elijah. The thought that Jesus is Elijah came from the prophecy in Malachi chapter 4, verse 5. It says in Malachi 4, 5, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. Since they did not recognize Jesus as the uh, prophesied Messiah or the prophesied Savior, they thought of him being Elijah. Because probably they knew of the prophecy in Micah chapter 4. And that's why most of the people during the time of Jesus is still expecting the coming of the Messiah. Or they did not recognize Jesus as the Messiah. So when the people failed to recognize who Jesus was and that uh, they recognized him as Elijah, so they were somehow degrading Jesus Christ for Jesus never received the glory that he deserved for being the Christ. So they thought of him as Elijah being prophesied in Malachi chapter 4, verse 5. But in Matthew chapter 7 or 17, we learn that Elijah being prophesied in Malachi chapter 4 was not really Elijah or was not really Jesus Christ, but somebody else. We learn that in Matthew chapter 17, verses 10, 11, 12, and 13. The disciple asked him, why then do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? So the disciples asked Jesus. Jesus replied, Elijah does indeed come, and he will restore all things. But I tell you that Elijah has already come, and they did not recognize him, but have done to him whatever they wish. They beheaded John the Baptist. In the same way, the Son of Man will suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he was speaking about John the Baptist. So what was prophesied in Malachi chapter 4 regarding Elijah was not really Elijah or was not really Jesus Christ, but it was John the Baptist. So people thought that Jesus was the prophesied Elijah in Malachi chapter 4. Now, the third answer, excuse me, was as Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Now, the way they viewed Jesus as Elijah was the same reason they viewed Jesus as Jeremiah or as, sorry, as Elijah. It was also prophesied that a prophet will come. In Deuteronomy 18, verse 15, Moses continued, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, your fellow Israelites. You must listen to him. So when Moses said that God would raise a prophet like him amongst them, the people were looking forward to a particular prophet. They were looking for this particular prophet that was prophesied in Deuteronomy. So they thought that Jesus fulfilled that prophecy in Deuteronomy 18.15 and that he must be Jeremiah or any of the prophets or one of the prophets. <clears throat> now, they are actually right. They are actually right that Jesus indeed was the fulfillment of Deuteronomy 18 verse 5. But the thing is, they never thought him as the Messiah. They believed that Jesus was the one being spoken of in Deuteronomy 18.15, and they were right. But again, the problem with them is that they never thought that Jesus was the Messiah. And they were still waiting for the Messiah because they only believed that he, Jesus, was just a prophet and not the Messiah. 
then notice that they never said, they never said that Jesus was the Messiah. They mistook him for somebody else. Now in Acts chapter 3, after the Pentecost, verses 22 and 23, now Peter quoted what Moses said in Deuteronomy chapter 18, particularly verse 15 and 19 of Deuteronomy. Now in Acts chapter 3, 22 and 23, for Moses said, the Lord your God will rise, raise up for you a prophet like me from among your brothers. You must listen to him in everything he tells you. Exactly what was written in Deuteronomy chapter 18. <clears throat> and everyone who does not listen to him will be completely cut off from among his people. Deuteronomy 18 verse 19. <clears throat> so when Moses or when Peter quoted Deuteronomy 18, 15 and 19, he was referring to Jesus Christ. So therefore, the prophecy of Moses was Jesus Christ. Again, the people thought that Jesus was indeed the prophesied prophet in Deuteronomy 18. But the problem is they did not recognize him as being the Messiah. And he was somebody else. They were still waiting for the anointed one. They were still waiting for this Messiah to come. Now, though all those <clears throat> mentioned names were great men of the Bible, John the Baptist, Elijah, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets, they undermined Jesus Christ. They undermined Jesus Christ because they short of giving Jesus the proper honor and the proper glory for who he really was. For they failed to recognize him. They knew him just John the Baptist. They knew him just a person trying to give uh, and preach about repentance. They knew him just one of the prophets. But they did not recognize him being the Messiah. So they undermined Jesus Christ. <clears throat> now let's go to the answer of Peter. When Jesus Christ asked him the same question. Now the answer of Peter, verses 15, 16 of Matthew. But what about you? Jesus asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, <clears throat> the son of the living God. Now let us analyze the answers, both the answers of the people and the answer of Peter. <clears throat> Excuse me. Who is Jesus? The people thought Jesus as John the Baptist. They thought him as Elijah. They thought him as one of uh, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. While Peter answered Jesus being the Christ, the Messiah, the son of the living God. Here's another question. Looking at this, what's the difference that, uh, what difference can we see in the answers of the people and the answer of Peter? What can we conclude? What can we say about the people's answer and Peter's answer? The people's answer were kind of backward, backward, and they are stuck in the moment. Okay. Now, when I say backward, they saw Jesus as someone from the past, someone from the past coming to life. Okay. They saw Jesus as that. They looked backward. Okay. And stuck in the moment, meaning they saw Jesus as nothing more than a prophet, nothing more than a messenger, or even a miracle worker, with which the benefits will just be for the moment. 
just here right now for the moment. So the, the, the people's answer were backward and they were stuck in the moment. While the answer of Peter was forward looking. His answer was forward looking or future oriented. It was future oriented and it was honor oriented. Now what does it mean? When Peter said, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God, Peter was honoring Jesus for who he really is. He was recognizing Jesus as not being John the Baptist. He was recognizing Jesus as not one of the prophets or Elijah, but he was recognizing Jesus as being Jesus, being the Christ, being the Messiah, the anointed one, and being the son of God and God at that. So the answer of Peter was honor and glory oriented. Now, since he knew who Jesus was and Jesus' purpose for coming here, Peter was looking forward to the value of Jesus in his life, being the Messiah. For he knew that Jesus would save him. And that Jesus would one day give him the crown of life. So he was future oriented. He was looking forward, forward looking. Not like the people. They were backward looking and they were stuck in the moment. While Peter's answer was honor, glory oriented. And it was future oriented. That's a big difference from how the people view Jesus and how Peter view Jesus. And you see that how you view Jesus will make the difference in your life. And how Peter viewed Jesus really indeed changed his life. For in the following verses in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus gave him the key to the kingdom. Now, many view Jesus for their needs in this life only. Until right this very moment, many view Jesus as for this life alone, stuck in the moment. But Peter saw Jesus differently. He saw his life with Jesus in the future, which is way, way, way better. Now, let me ask you this question. Do you see your life with Jesus? Or are you seeing your life with Jesus in the future someday? Are you seeing your life with Jesus in heaven someday? Or are you stuck in the moment? You are just looking at Jesus just for this life alone. I want you to see Jesus future-oriented. I want you to see your life right now that you are with Jesus in his kingdom. I want you to see your life being with Jesus someday in heaven with all the saved. Don't just think Jesus for this life. Think about Jesus and think about the crown of life that Jesus will give to you someday. And that was the testimony of Peter. Now, as with the testimony of Thomas, when Thomas said, my Lord and my God, it was honor glory oriented Thomas he acknowledged the very being of Jesus Christ now it was also future oriented when Thomas said my Lord and my God and I want to believe that Thomas was looking forward he was looking forward to his crown of life someday that Jesus would give to him so let us be future oriented now, here's the best part. Here is the best part. If Jesus would ask you now, who do you say I am? And I said, this is the best part. When Jesus asks you now, who do you say I am? What would your answer be? Who do you say Jesus is? When Jesus is right here, right now, is standing next to you or in front of you and asks you, who do you say I am? What will your answer be? What would be your testimony? 
And this is so important. Because how you view Jesus will make all the difference in your life. Remember that. And this is because it will change your outlook in life. It will change how you think. You will be thinking differently. Your way of thinking will affect your way of living and your behavior. How you view Jesus Christ will affect your total being, will affect your life. Because you are now aligning yourself. You are now aligning your life with that of Jesus Christ. You are now living a Christ-centered life. And that's what Jesus wants us all to live, a Christ-centered life. Who do you say I am? Now, I will talk about, I will discuss two things that most people say who Jesus is. And we sang that a while ago. <clears throat> two common answers. And probably this is uh, also your, your common answer. The number one, people would say who Jesus is. They would say, Jesus is my Savior. And probably that's our answer also. If Jesus would ask you, we will say, you are my Savior. And they will easily point to two, to two things. You know. They will easily point to two of Jesus' uh, life events as a proof. First is his birth in Matthew 1, 21. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. So Jesus is my Savior. They will point to Matthew 1, 21. They will tell you, oh, Jesus is my Savior because he came here to save his people from their sins. <clears throat> and the next one, they will point to the death of Jesus Christ. They will point to his crucifixion in Romans chapter 5, verse 8. But God demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So Jesus is my Savior. Jesus came down to save me. And this is the popular answer. If you would ask people, who did, do they think Jesus is? My Savior. My Savior. Now the second, people would say that who Jesus is, they would say that Jesus is my Lord. Jesus is my Lord. But the question is, what is the meaning? What is the meaning of the Lordship of Jesus? If we say Jesus is my Lord, what do you mean, your Lord? What do you mean, Lord? So what is the Lordship of Jesus? <clears throat> the origin and etymology of Lord in both Hebrew and Greek languages demonstrate the depth and breadth of its meaning. This title represents God's supreme power, authority, and rulership over all things. It serves as a reminder of his sovereignty and serves to inspire reverence and devotion. So when we say that Jesus is my Lord, when you say Jesus is your Lord, it means he rules over you. He rules over me. He is my ruler. He has authority over me. I acknowledge that Jesus has supreme power over me. Therefore, I must revere and be subjected to him. So when we say Jesus is my Lord, what do you mean by that? What do you mean by that? Is he ruling over your life? Does Jesus have the authority in your life? Submission, subjection, it means, you know, following him in the social setting in the social setting during the biblical times when they say lord it means master lord means master in the social setting during biblical times having a servant or servants under his authority and uh, ownership so when people in the biblical times they would utter the word lord it means that person 
owns them. He is my master, and I am his servant. There is a master-servant relationship when they utter the word Lord. And same with the principle. When we use the word Lord for Jesus Christ, there is a master and servant relationship. Jesus Christ being our master, we are his servants. And as we are his servants, we follow him. We subject ourselves to him. So when you say, Jesus is my Lord, my, my question is, what do you mean by the word Lord? Are you following Jesus? Do you subject your, your, your life, your whole being to Jesus Christ? Or are you just saying that because you want to say it? <clears throat> Genesis 24 verse 9, just a, an example. So the servant put his hand under the thigh of his master, Abraham, and swore an oath to him concerning this matter. One use of the word master, lordship, and servant. The word master from the, from, from the Hebrew word audon or audon, it is translated as Lord. And with the same principle, with the same meaning, being having authority, having supreme power, having ownership, the same idea applies to the social setting during those times. So therefore, when we say Jesus is my Lord, we are actually following him. He rules over us. Now, having said these things, we often hear people, they would uh, quote Romans 10, chapter 9, that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. The idea of confessing, my dear brethren and friends, <clears throat> The idea of confessing is professing in full agreement with what you are declaring. When you confess, it is in full agreement, full agreement with what you believe, full agreement with what your mouth is saying. So the word confess means in agreement, in full agreement. What you say is what you do. And that is what the word confess means. And it's therefore our, our verbal declaration <clears throat> must agree with the way we live in full agreement on what we declare. That's what confess means. So when we say that Jesus is my Lord, it means that Jesus, he is the center of our lives and we follow him. So confessing, it is not just saying Lord, you, Jesus, you are my Lord. It is not just an utterance of words. That's not about it. It must be seen in your life that indeed that Jesus is your Lord. Your words must agree with your actions. And that's what confess means. In agreement. That's why Jesus said in Matthew chapter 15, verse 8, These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. You see, so it is not just saying with your mouth. It is not just declaring, confessing with your mouth. But having Jesus at the center of your heart. It is obeying Jesus. When we say that Jesus is my Lord and yet we do not subject ourselves with him, then we are hypocrites. We are hypocrites. And Jesus would say, you people, you love me. You honor me with your lips. But your heart, your being is far from me. What you say is contrary to what you are doing. Therefore, we fall short of what lordship of Jesus means. And confessing, it also has the idea of endorsing. Remember last time, last Sunday, we talked about this. Our testimony is our endorsement of Jesus. Again, when 
in, in, a, uh, in a corporate setting, when you use a particular product, and when you are endorsing the product, the very reason why you are endorsing the product is you've been an actual user, and you saw the benefits of that product. That's why you are endorsing it, because you want others to benefit in that product as well. So the same reason why you are testifying, why you are giving your testimony, you are endorsing Jesus to other people because you want that other person to benefit Jesus Christ. Whatever that Jesus Christ would give to us, especially, especially the crown of life. That's why our confession is also our endorsement of Jesus Christ. And we know that in serving Jesus Christ, that there is a great reward that awaits us in heaven. That's why we are confessing him to others so that these people can have that reward in heaven as well. You see, we are, we are not saved or we are saved not because we just confess. We are saved not just because we declare, but because we live in our being the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Because we subject ourselves with Jesus Christ, being Him as our Lord. And this is one reason, you know, why, why Satan doesn't call Jesus his Lord. You know, I've been reading the Bible, and I, I, I discover the internet. Good thing that we have Mr. Google. I was trying to, to find out if Satan called Jesus Lord, but none, none. Satan never called Jesus Christ Lord. You know the reason why? You go back again to the meaning of what Lord is. Lord means subjecting yourself to Jesus Christ. And Satan, he his life is not about Jesus. He didn't subject himself to Jesus Christ. And that's why, that's why Satan is Satan. And that's the difference between a Christian and Satan and those who followed the devil. Because we subject ourselves to Jesus Christ, but them, they do not. You see? Simply put, Satan is not obedient to Jesus Christ. When we say Jesus is my Lord, we put our allegiance to Jesus. And Satan does not. And remember, during the temptation of Jesus Christ, you know, Satan tempts Jesus by offering Jesus these things. Let's go back to Luke chapter 4, six and seven let's go back to his to the temptation of jesus christ satan said i will give you all their authority and splendor i will give you all all of these things authority and splendor it has been given to me satan is the one talking satan told jesus christ all of this has been given to me and i can give it to anyone i want to if you worship me it will all be yours. You see, Satan, <clears throat> uh, what Satan was trying to convey to Jesus, he was trying to convey to Jesus that make me your Lord. Subject yourself to me. Worship me. Bow down to me and I will give you all these things. See, be my servant. And the essence of lordship, we can see in the temptation of Satan. You see the word, Satan mentioned the word authority, splendor. He mentioned the word worship, see, which is submission. So when we say that Jesus is our Lord, the question is, are we following him? Even Satan uses the word authority he uses the word worship because he wanted jesus 
to bow down to him and be Jesus Lord. But of course, Jesus would not do that. He will not do that. So again, when we say that Jesus is my Lord, are we following him? Or are we just being selective of our righteousness? Do we just select the righteousness that we want to follow in the Bible? When we say that Jesus is our Savior and our Lord, Titus chapter 2 tells us how. Titus 2, 11 and 12. It tells us how. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to everyone. It instructs us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live sensible, upright, and godly lives in the present age. You see, for the, for, by the grace of God, or for the grace of God has appeared. It says, bringing salvation to everyone. God's grace is manifested in Jesus Christ. Romans 3.24 tells us that we are justified uh, by God's grace as a gift through redemption in Christ Jesus. Jesus appeared bringing salvation to all. Of course, to be saved, one must accept the invitation of Jesus Christ. And verse 12, it tells us that this grace, this Jesus instructs us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live sensible, upright, and godly lives in the present age. That is the Lordship of Jesus in us. When you say Jesus is my Lord, then it instructs you to renounce ungodliness and give your allegiance to Jesus Christ. But if you say Jesus is your Lord and still you are living in sins, then you are lying. Because when we say Jesus is our Lord, it instructs us to renounce ungodliness and swore allegiance to Jesus. When we say Jesus is our Lord, we must kill our worldly passions and start living a godly life. Jesus is our Savior. It means Jesus fulfilling his purpose to save us. That's why he came here to seek and save the lost. He became a servant for all of us. He came not to be served, but to serve. And his death was his obedience to his purpose for us. Again, his, his death was his obedience to his purpose for us. Now, on the other hand, Jesus is our Lord means our obedience to him. Jesus being our master, and us being his servants. Now for us to be saved, my dear brethren and friends, we need to have Jesus in our lives, following the scripture and not any man-made creeds or man-made doctrines. Now for Jesus to be our Lord, we need full submission and we need to have full obedience to him. For we are serving him. He is our master. Now therefore, having said all of these things, the real essence and meaning of our testimony when we say that Jesus is our savior and Jesus is our Lord is that our lives, they are transformed. They are transformed and given to Jesus Christ. If your life is not transformed, but you say that Jesus is your Savior and Jesus is your Lord, we are just doing a lip service. And God knows our hearts. God knows our hearts. We might be lying to our fellow, but we are not lying to God. Soon we will reap either our reward or the condemnation that we deserve. We are not doing ourselves a great favor if we would lie to God. 
So my dear brethren and friends, who do you say Jesus is? Is he your, is he your Savior? Is he your Lord? Are you obeying him or not? They say to be or not to be. So who do you think Jesus is? Again, our view of Jesus will make all the difference in our life. So my dear brethren and friends, the gospel is yours. Make sure that Jesus indeed is your Savior and that Jesus indeed is your Lord. For those who have not yet accepted the Lord, scripturally, may we ask you to come forward and declare your allegiance to Jesus Christ so that you may be saved and have that crown of life that Jesus would give to those who would be faithful until the end. Good morning. God bless everybody. And shall we all stand as we sing the song of invitation.